Welcome, everybody, to Triangle Skeptics in the actual, real, in-person meat space pub. I'm going to pinch him to see if we're real. It's real. It's not a dream. Yeah. That was a psychic pinch, wasn't it? Oh, it didn't hurt? Thank you so much for coming, and to those watching the replay online, thank you for tuning in over the interwaves or whatever they are nowadays. We have a fantastic speaker for, uh, for our first time back in an indoor location in person. Susan Gerbic is founder and gra grand poobah of Monterey County Skeptics, also the founder of the Guerrilla Skepticism Project on and off Wikipedia. She is founder of the About Time Project, which is a sort of umbrella for many of those bodies. Uh, and all these things are true because I read them on Wikipedia. So if you don't believe me, look it up. Susan, did I leave anything out? Why am I? Oh, and Susan, I mean, Susan is on the East Coast with us instead of in Monterey, uh, Salinas, California, where she normally resides because she's been in DC receiving the Philip Kloss Award from the National Capital Area Skeptics. So we thank Susan so much for adding on this leg to her trip. And uh, she's going to give us a talk tonight about doing science activism in the middle of a global pandemic. So, Susan Gerbic. Okay, so I'm live, right? Am I there? You're hot. I'm hot, man, I'll tell you. Oh my gosh, North Carolina, what the hell is going on here? I'm from Salinas, California, next to the ocean. It's mild all year round. We don't deal with this stuff. This humidity stuff is like, what the? Anyway. So thank you so much for coming out. This is, it's always a joy to get to the smaller groups, and I mean that in the most affectionate way possible because it's, it's a lot of the smaller groups don't really get the attention because you don't have huge groups of people, you know, hundreds of people to show up. So I love coming to the smaller groups. And I know you had Brian Dunning out here recently, and if Dunning did it, I got to do it. So, you know, uh, we're, we're good friends. So anyway, and you can see... Am I going to be okay over here? It looks yeah. like some of you people are going to have problems seeing me. But if you guys want to back up or something yeah, or make yourself more comfortable, I'm very normal yeah. about that kind of stuff. So I am Susan Gerbic. I mm -hmm. am, a, um, as he said, the leader and uh, whatever of all these other organizations. I'm also a, a fellow with the Center for Inquiry, and I'm also a... Um, a recipient of at least two of James Randi, James Randi's Educational Foundation Awards. And um, it's mainly because I have such incredible people around me. It's not necessarily because of me, but as you will see from my presentation, it's more because of the people that, that tend to socialize and, well not socialize, tend to migrate around me. And um, my skill, if anything, is more managerial. And that's just keeping people in line, setting goals, pushing to, them to finish things and stuff like that and checking up on them. So what I'm going to talk about today, and I'm sorry it's hot in here, but it's about 40, 45 minutes, something like that. And I really appreciate if you give me lots of fe feedback or Q&A afterwards. And I don't know you guys, you don't know me. And so that's going to be really interesting that you're, 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 most of you don't know me, are checking in to see what the heck I'm going to be talking about today. So. What I am doing is I'm talking about uh, my project. This is the About Time Project, and I will give you the screenshot several times. Maybe I should come this way so people can see sort of. I don't know. You guys are, some people are in some places, some people are in other places. Well, I think we can see. All right. It, I'm not that important. So just, just watch the screen, just listen to my voice. So um, what's going on is I'm going to talk mostly about the things that I did during the pandemic. I'm extremely active year-round with activism, scientific skepticism, activism. More of a, like, uh, in your face sometimes and more like get things done kind of personality and kind of things that we'll, we'll do. But during the pandemic, I was locked down just like you guys all were in California and my home. But we took advantage of that. And when I say we, I have several groups of people that do these things. So what I'm going to talk about tonight as I said, I'm going to show you this several times. I'm going to talk about some things that we did. Now, this is a nice, clear screen, but I don't expect you to read the stuff that's on the screen because you will not see it. And it's more there as a visual for you to understand where I'm going with this. So I'm going to put up a lot of things that do have text. I know I can tell you don't look and read the text, but you're going to be like this anyway because I know how skeptics are. So just keep that in mind. Everything I'm talking about is on the website abouttimeproject.org. You'll be able to go there later. You can fall into the rabbit hole, and you can read about everything I did before the pandemic. But mainly, this is just the stuff that's happened since the pandemic. 
So I have many different teams that work for with me. And the one I'm gonna be talking about first is the Gorilla Skeptics. Now this is a group that is very small. It's changed hands mo multiple times with different people. I use people depending on their location and whatever the activity is. Mostly I work with psychics. Uh, and when I talk about psychics, I'm not necessarily talking about the one that's in the street corner that has a shop. Mainly my focus is those that have a little more pr uh, prominence. They have TV shows, or they're getting some kind of notability. And uh, those are the ones I really focus on. And when I say psychics, I mean mediums, people who claim to speak to the dead, people who are um, uh, taking money for that. Now, I know that's a big term because they're, I will say the word psychics, but I actually am really mainly focusing on uh, people who are uh, grief vampires, so that's what we call them. Uh, people who are trying to get a hook in somebody who has a missing child, or, or whatever's going on, you know, where they're, they're lonely, they're desperate. And I want to make sure I'm very clear on this at the very beginning, that, it's, that people who fall for this are not stupid or uneducated people. Most people can fall for a scam if given the right parameters in their lives. And people who go to the, to the, um, the, the buy-in to the speaking to the dead are mostly people who are, uh, have been in a religious household who, who that's not such a big leap for somebody to th who believes in the afterlife to, to think that you can contact them for a, some money. So they, most of them are ra raised in these households where that's kind of normal. And also in the time we're living, especially, come on in, and especially in the, find them a spot. Especially in the time that uh, they're the, somewhere. Put them over there. So, so mainly in the time that we're living in with the, um, uh, the pandemic, there's a lot of desperate people out there who are just lonely. And, um, you know, we may be more social people. Thank you guys for coming out. But a lot of people, di that didn't happen to them. They did not have an outlet. They had nobody to be able to talk to. They didn't have the ability to, um, uh, if you remember the beginning of the pandemic, how frightening it was. I mean, it was terrifying. At least I was terrified, having bad nightmares n way before we had vaccines. And so we didn't know what to expect, how much worse it was going to get. So people turned to these kind of people. So here we go. As I said, do not read all these things. They're all on my website. So these are two different articles that I've done. And again, you can't really see it from where you are probably. But they're on the website about timeproject.org. And I'll show you that screen again. So these are here as guides to talk about some of the things that we've done. So since the pandemic, this article I wrote, and this is a thing that I hear constantly. My boyfriend is Mark Edward, who's my partner, and he's at home taking care of the cats right now in California. And um, he's a mentalist who specializes in psychics. So I'm more concerned with the hot readers. That's people who have information about you before you attend the event. Um, than the cold readers, which is more typical of a psychic. They, they read you in person. They can see you. They smell you. They look at your rings. They can listen to your accent. And they pick up, you know, just, just things about you as they know you. Anybody who's ever been in sales, cold reads. That's just the way it is. Because when somebody comes in, you're making a decision about a person. Um, are they here to buy shoes? Can I get an upgrade to the better vacation spot? You know, whatever. So, so cold reading is something that humans do. We make assumptions about people. And then the cold readers tend to just really make a general statement that sounds very real to people. So we hear this phrase constantly. There is no way the psychic could have known. I hear that all the time. And people tell me, oh, you couldn't, we wouldn't have known because I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Twitter, my father died in 1930, so how could they know about him? I'm, I'm here to tell you they can know. If a psychic wants to know, they can find out something. If they can't, they'll skip you and move to somebody else. Because they only need a few people in the room to really look accurate. So some people are really hard to find information on, especially if you have a common name and you're not on social media. It's really more difficult. But it isn't impossible. Um, we have people, uh, Mark Edward tells about, because he was a mentalist and did the psychic stuff for years. You go to the bathroom, you get in the stall, pick your feet up, lock the door, and somebody comes in, and they're having a conversation with somebody else. 
you walk, you look underneath to see what their shoes are, and then you follow them out, and you can see what, where they sit, and then whatever they were talking about, a business trip, a vacation, a grandchild coming. There's ways of finding out if you want to. And we've done all those tricks. It's all much easier than you think. So what I have put up here, and this whole article is about many ways they can know. If you have lived in the United States, there is probably something about you in a record. You probably have a birth announcement in the paper. You probably broke your arm or uh, in, in some kind of way that was unusual enough to get you into a newspaper. You probably had, were in, uh, where you're in the honor roll, or you graduated somewhere, or on and on and on. There is a record of you. Somebody dies in your family, you are probably listed on there as somebody who's part of the, the obituary. So these are Facebook photos. I just took them ra kind of randomly off my Facebook feed. And just looking at the background and the different things around me and, and so on, you can pick up tons of information about me. I have cats. Um, I like to read. Um, you know, there's a lot of flowers. There's a jigsaw puzzle, tons of books. There's just tells everywhere if they want to look at a photo and on a person as well. Again, you're looking at the rings, you're listening to my accent. I probably have an accent compared to you guys, right? So hopefully I'll, 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 hopefully I'll be right. Not at all. This is another article that happened during the, um, the pandemic. A woman reached out to me and said, "There's n Susan, it's just because you've never had a reading from a real psychic, that's why you don't believe, right? So she contacted me because I had a, there was a New York Times Magazine article that about two of the stings that I had done back in 2018, I think is when it appeared in the New York Times. So, um, and that's on my website too, if you want to see that. And she contacted me because of that. And she said, you know, I'd like to give you a free, free reading. And I said, no problem, but let's do it on Facebook Live, which is where we are right now. I have a Facebook Live. Sorry, everybody in the future. Um, <laughs> or over on this video, that's the people in the future. So. What happened is I said, I want to do it live on Facebook. Come on in. Somebody find him a chair. Here's a chair. Put it over there somewhere. So what we said is that um, what I would do is I didn't want the woman to, to, if she was so accurate, so positive, and so perfect, I didn't want to be accused of editing the video to make her look bad, right? So if she was so accurate, everybody who's watching on Facebook Live would know as well at the same time. Hmm? Okay. Okay, cool. So what happened is I turned, uh, she wouldn't be on camera. So I just took my phone and I dialed her number and I put it on speakerphone and I let the Zoom screen go to me. And then for two hours, she was giving me a reading. It was an abysmal failure. Um, all the audio and everything, the video is up on my, uh, in the article, you can look at it if you really want to watch it. Because then we did an hour afterwards where she hung up and people that were watching came in and they really were interested because of the, the words she used. She really believed she was psychic. And um, I didn't give her a lot of tells. I mean, I didn't, I was just like, that's very interesting. That's really interesting. I didn't say yes or no. She had all kinds of problems. My grandparents, I've never met any of them. They were long dead before I was born. And so she had me watching TV with them, eating popcorn with them and all kinds of stuff. But then I had a back and forth with her later. And so that's all in the article as well. So if you find that interesting. Another thing I did during the pandemic and my team did is we went to every single psychic we could find website or social media and look to see if they predicted the pandemic. Because obviously the pandemic has affected every single one of us, right? So what I did is I went and we did screenshots. So it's evidential or we put, loaded the website to uh, the Wayback Machine, which, re, which freezes the page, right? So one of the things I did in this article, they oddly did not see this coming, was just over, 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 over different psychics that are booking themselves so not only did they not see the pandemic coming, but they booked themselves for events during the, the, the thing. So they would say, you know, I'm going to be in like John, John Edward. He had, um, John Edward, is that his name? Gosh. Crossing over. Yeah, crossing over with John Edward. Okay. My boyfriend's name is Mark Edward. So it's just like, 
So, um, so John Edward was going to Australia. He planned uh, uh, all these events in Australia. Why would he plan all these events in Australia if we, he knew something was going on? Maybe he shouldn't, you know, I'll give him a benefit of the doubt. Possibly, maybe they wouldn't have known exactly it'd be called COVID-19, it would be exactly this and coming out of wherever. But they should have known there'd be disruptions in their events. But no, they didn't. And not only did they make these appointments, they went on vacation, uh, and then they had to cancel the vacation. Here's Teresa Caputo. She had all these events uh, that she had to cancel. This is John Edward, you know, and it says, you know, cancel, 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 new date. He doesn't give us a date. Why? I don't know. Because he should know, right, when we're going to be free to come back to us. Uh, she canceled her shows and then had to reschedule them and then canceled it again. So, I mean, come on now. You should know these things. This is, um, this is uh, I think this is Teresa Caputo again, a cancel event in Reno. And all of the sites will say, who? Thomas John. Yeah, and Thomas John in this side. Thomas John is my favorite because Thomas John is the one that they did the article on me and him in the uh, New York Times that I caught him big time. And he went and he had... Um, uh, Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. He had a show there where he'd do his little thing. And we were following it. And I've got lots of articles on what I did with it. But he, he I have some screenshots of people saying, Thomas, how long are you going to be in Vegas? And he's like, indefinitely. And so buy your tickets for June and July. You know, the tickets are now available on Ticketmaster. And we're like, buy your tickets for, for your event in June and July? How could you? It's all canceled, you know, so, and then now he's gone. So it was pretty funny. Here's another thing I did, and I'm going through these kind of quickly because I know the articles exist somewhere else where you can look at them. This is a fun one. This guy's a UK skeptic, and he's like the flavor of the day UK skeptic. He's the kind of really maximizes Facebook where he uses Messenger, he spams people. He's, he's like um, very low price um, psychic, and it's just general information. But a Facebook group approached me because I'm known for my psychics, uh, being involved in the psychics. And it was, a, it was a James Higgins psychic scammer exposed Facebook page. You don't need to know who he is really because he's just some guy. But he's really, he's really taken advantage of a lot of people who are really desperate looking for information. And then he's really been doing a lot with the Facebook feeds. They can't get rid of the spam. They're constantly spammed. He threatens people. It's just really ugly. Anyway, so I write for Skeptical Inquire, and I, I publish there. The person who I pub, who's like my, who oversees me and approves articles and things like that is Barry Carr, who's the person who puts on PsyCon every year. So I wrote to Barry and I said, hey, you know, I want to write about this guy. And he's like, why, Susan? That's not worth your time. He's nobody. I said, I know, but he's kind of fun, you know, and there's this Facebook group that's trying to expose him. And so I went to the Facebook group and I said, you know, I'm looking for screenshots. Could some people in here give me screenshots of these specific things for the article I'm going to write for Skeptical Inquire? And a day later, I get a message from somebody who says, or James Higgins, and says, you know, hey, you know, you can't be doing that. I'm going to sue you and have a nice day. So uh, he really did. So I went to Barry Carr, and any time I write about a psychic, I have to also give the information to the lawyer of see if I make sure I'm not slamming anybody and getting sued. So I ran it by them, and I said, look, they're going to, he says he's going to sue me. He's like, oh, now you got to write the article, right? <laughs> so, so we did write the article. It was, it was fun. It was an interesting look into a different kind of psychic medium. Another thing, now don't get, don't get hungry. I started doing, um, uh, I did a lot of other things. During the pandemic, we did something called Operation Lemon Meringue. All my investigations start with Operation and they have food. It's all, all of them. Onion rings, um, uh, Operation Ice Cream Cone, Operation Pizza Roll, P Operation Peach Pit. They're all like that. So during the pandemic, we did Operation Lemon Meringue. So there's a ton of articles that are associated with that. One of the things we did, Thomas John, that's that psychic I was telling you about that was at Caesars. He, um, we started going back, I've, I've written so many articles about him. We started going back and looking at some of the things he'd done. And when you've watched enough videos by these people, you, you, they all have their own method, right? So what we noticed is Thomas John was looking at the screen. Now, I don't know how he's doing it, but I 
uh, in my opinion, uh, there's my um, disclaimer, right? In my opinion, somebody's feeding the hot read, feeding hot reading to him. And what, when you're looking at a computer screen, and anybody who uses Facebook, one of the things appears at the bottom of the Facebook page on Messenger is that's where it opens up on the lower right-hand corner of the screen. So he has, we've noticed as he's, we watch a lot of his videos, that he peeks into the, to the lower right-hand corner of the screen. He's looking at you straight on, and he's the whoever he's reading, and he's giving gibberish. It's all like, um, you know, uh, I see gen, very general, yeah. And it's just like, like he's trying to save time. I mean, uh, trying to s stall. And then all of a sudden, he looks into the right hand corner, and then he comes up with something like spot on, like who's buddy, you know, like that kind of thing. So I have a 30 second clip. I don't think it's going to have audio, but that's okay. You don't need it. So pay attention. And if you look, you're going to see him peek. And if you're looking really hard, you might see him peek twice. So check this out. Let's see if it works. This is about 30 seconds. So how do I make it go? Enter. <laughs> there he is. Now watch him. He's talking to somebody on a Zoom screen that will appear in a minute. Yeah, oh, <laughs> trust me, trust me. I, this guy's appearing in my dreams. It's just his voice. Nightmare. Oh, yeah, that too. So to watch. He's just getting a psychic feeling. He says, the last couple of years for you have been really, really stressful. No kidding. It's the pandemic. <laughs> now watch. Watch for it. Peek again. So he does this peak thing. I haven't done it yet, but I want to uh, try to come up with a, um, a video of just peak, 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 and I could probably do that. But it would be kind of fun. But I busted this guy so many times that it's just after a while. Um, he appears a lot with other psychics who are, you know, not as famous or not as uh, you know popular as he is. They don't have TV shows like he did. So. So he had others. This is Kimberly Meredith. We watched their, their feed. We, we, we signed into Zoom, which is easy because we're all on Zoom. We could just be anonymous. And you go in, and um, you're just watching and recording the whole thing. And we can, as they're calling on people, their name's right there on the Zoom screen, my team is watching and goes to their Facebook page. And we'll say, I guess they're going to get something about a dog because they've got a dog up on their Facebook page just having health problems. And then he'll come along and say, something about it, it's, it's like an animal, and I'm getting this yellow kind of, uh, it's kind of large, like a medium size. I think it's a dog. Is it a, is it a dog that's named Buddy? How did you know? And my team's like, yeah, there's Buddy. You know, We knew that was coming. So we can follow this. Kimberly Meredith is an interesting one because she doesn't heal people. She, she well, what she does is she looks at a person, she'll have them stand up on Zoom and so she can look at their body, but she blinks really rapidly. And she blinks at them. And that's how she gets her, uh, she sees what's wrong with a person. It's almost always something that's like, you know, back problems or stomach problems or something like that. And she talks about blinking all the time. Here comes a food. So. No, that's, just hand it out, I don't care. I can see when they're coming and I'll, I'll let you know. You're psychic. You know I know. Okay, see where they're going. Do you need forks and knives too? I think they need utensils. Yeah, napkins too. So, um, so these are all really interesting. Suzanne Northrup's been around a very long time. She's also a, a cold reading kind of person. When my boyfriend, my boyfriend was with, uh, is with uh, Michael Shermer's group, the Skeptic Society. He was one of the early fellows, and back way before I knew my boyfriend. Um, he had done a TV show with Michael Shermer and Suzanne Northrup was, was the person they busted. And so it was fun to come back in and see where she is now. So that was a, one of the Operation Lemon Ring. So uh, again, I will show you about this in a minute. Here's another thing that we did during the pandemic is Thomas John had us a TV show, and this is before I met him or knew of him, and it's called Seat Belt, Seat Belt Psychic. You know, put a seatbelt on. So you, the premise is it's only one, it was only one season. You get in the back of the car, you put your seatbelt on, he drives away from the car, the curb, and then he gives he talks about your dead fellow members. Oh, more food. Here we go. Pass them down.
Okay, so what he does in the Seatbelt Psychic show is he, um, it was very odd. I wrote about Seatbelt Psychic. You can read all about that. Read all about it. But on this, we revisited Seatbelt Psychic. So what we noticed about Seatbelt Psychic is he doesn't, it's supposed, he's supposed to be like a ride share. But there were so many odd things. Like the people would get in the car and they put their seatbelt on and then he would drive away. And at no time did he put any information in the little, you know, iPhone that's like at the thing. No time he did he confirm who the person was who got into the car. No time did the person ever have bags like they're going to the airport. At no time did, you know, any of that happen. The other thing, they always sat in the same seat. They always sat in this, like he's driving, so they're sitting in the right seat. They never moved over. And if there was two people in the car, they'd sit here and somebody would sit in the middle. No one ever sat in the, the comfortable seat over. And that's because the camera had a better angle on the people. The other thing is we noticed is that the people always looked too dressed. They didn't have any kind of logos, no kind of you know, T-shirts that had like uh, baseball hats, nothing like that. Their hair looked a little too well combed and groomed. And that's because they're, you know, they're like they're extras, kind of. The other thing we noticed is there's multiple camera angles. So as the people are walking up to the car, there's a video on them. They get in the car, there's a video on them and, and multiple angles. So we're thinking, why didn't nobody get in the car and go, what is up with all these cameras, right? <laughs> nobody ever said that. So um, I ended, ended up interviewing somebody who was in the back seat of the car. I found somebody, actually. So during the pandemic, because that's all before the pandemic, more food. Quesadilla. Quesadilla, I think that's Jeff. Here comes some more. <laughs> Pass it down. <laughs> Did, can you can you guys give him some utensils and stuff too back there? Oh, he's got some. Got it. So just like cash cab? Hmm? Cash cab. Like a cash cab, exactly. In fact, I think it's probably made by and very more disappointing. He makes people cry. So what we noticed is we went back and looked at his videos, and this time we looked at the videos, but we turned off the sound, which made it more peace peaceable. But my team, we just got on a Facebook group that we have a private Facebook private Facebook group called Operation Grief Vampire. You can't you can't find it, it's very secret. But we noticed is we made screenshots every time there was an image showing behind the window. So these are screenshots of the same location. Three different women get in the car, and we could see this location. It's very distinctive. And we started looking it up on maps, and we figured out where he was picking them all up from the same location. <laughs> that ain't no Uber driver, right? <laughs> so we were able to figure that out. The other thing we figured out is you can look through the window of his car. Here he is in three different outfits, supposedly three different days, exactly the same location. So we figured out he was going in a giant loop in North Hollywood. He was always in the right-hand lane. He only turned right. It was always a right turn. So probably for insurance reasons, he's probably driving around like that. So we knew where he was picking him up. We knew, and we also knew that the show was edited in such a way. Here comes the coleslaw. Sure. That's okay. You're on film. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. So we found out that what he was doing is some of the audio was off. So like he would say, okay, wherever. Anything else? I'm glad she's on it. She knows this stuff. So we noticed that the audio was wrong because if he was talking to somebody, having a conversation, you could see through the window where they were when they're having the conversation, like there'd be stop traffic at a signal. And then the conversation would continue and they're going through a tunnel and there was like no time that passed. They're going through a highway tunnel. You could see it. And then a minute later, 
the conversation would continue and they're still at that stoplight where the where the cars are parked exactly the same cars so we could see how it was edited that they were obviously editing it to mean something else so anyway this article was something we did during the the pandemic here's another picture of um people getting into the back seat or they're letting them out and the, we could see kaiser permanetti it's a hospital in, in uh, la we could find it in the back this is a library so we were able to see that in all the videos and this is a uh, article called um, right turns only. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to New Zealand for a moment. This is a, a woman called Jeanette Wilson. You don't need to know who she is. She's just a, a, a psychic healer in New Zealand. Oh, I'm sorry. She doesn't heal. God is the only one who can heal. So what she does is she channels doctors who are dead, and they will heal you. Okay, they will tell you what's wrong, and then they will heal you. That's how it works. So this woman is pretty prominent over in New Zealand. <laughs> And what she does is she is um, uh, the New Zealand skeptics, because I love all the different groups out there. I'm involved with them. Here comes the waters. Water. Water, water, water. So she was tied to, so the New Zealand skeptics, just like you, it's a group that goes to, it sometimes does things, and they were going to her events. And what they discovered at her events is that she was, at one point, her husband was videotaping everything. Things went up on YouTube. But then the, he would pause the video and then restart it. And during the, the, this pause, she would go into an anti-vax rant. So she was really, so, so she was pretending she was an anti-vax, also anti-mammogram, into ghosts, all sorts of stuff. So, but it didn't show up on her YouTube site. So what we did is about three in the morning for me in California is I and some other the New Zealand skeptics attended her show over Zoom because you know, you can. And it was a lot of meditation. It was really hard to stay up for two hours. The clouds are floating and everything. And she went on to talk about ghost photography and, and so on. And I'm recording it. So what happens is that after it was over, because I never, ever let on who I am. When, when I do any of the stings, we play it out to the end. We always stay in character. We never jump up and say, hey, you're a fraud. Never. So I stayed in character, and at the end, about 4 in the morning, I said to her, uh, they had a question and answer time, and I said, look, I'm living in, I said I was in Vegas, because that was my profile in case they did a hot read, that I looked like it was in Vegas. And there's a, there's a 100,000 people dead in the United States from COVID. That's how long ago it was. And I said, I'm very frightened. Everybody's frightened. Uh, what's going to happen? What's going to become of us? And so she gave me 16 minutes of ranting about vaccines, how much she supports Trump, how much she's, uh, how she was good, she, she could hook you up with a, a supplement that they sell. Here comes Guinness and something else. Um, some supplement they sell that would coat your lungs, that would keep you from getting COVID, and on and on and on. So she gave me 16 minutes of a prized, I'm recording. I don't know how she didn't know I was recording. She's a psychic, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's fair. If I was ever taking the court, I'd say, well, they should have known, right? I mean, you know, come on. So New Zealand skeptics have a relationship with the, site, uh, with the media there. So there was a, so when I got the video, they took the video and put it on, um, gave it to a reporter in New Zealand. And the reporter had intervie interviews her. And during the interview, he asked her about her anti-vaccine views and cope, you know, anti-COVID and all that other stuff. And she says, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, I just watched the video. And she's like, what video? You know? So I put it up on my YouTube site for the, site, for the newspaper to, to get it. So he did a really wonderful uh, video on her, uh, article on her. The spinoff is like a... A, like Politico, or not political, but it's like big enough that it's a name. It's not like a New York Times, but it's, it's a big enough uh, uh, site that it's, it has journalistic integrity kind of thing. So this is an article about that. She was really pissed off, but oh well. But uh, some time passes, and in, in uh, uh, New Zealand, they have a, um, they, they have like a House of Representative kind of government. It's, it's like that you run for local office and then you could be prime minister or whatever, I guess. So she decided she was going to run for office. And so she did try, but she only ended up having a 22-hour political career. So she was psh, right away. No, no, she tried to get, she said she was going to run. 
Yeah, she was going to run and they ixed her. Now, I don't know if the articles we had written on her had anything to do with it. She had other problems, too, but, you know, that was probably part of it. Well, New Zealand is an advanced country. Yeah, they are advanced, you know. So what happened, and now these people are all distorted. There's nothing wrong with their eyes. But this is what a screen looks like, if, but their names are clear and their faces are clear. So when you attend one of these events on Zoom, there could be 300 people on there. 20 bucks a person, that's a lot of money for a couple hours, right? He does two re 10 readings. Some of the people he's already read before, which is another form of hot reading. But this is the idea. Again, you can see cold reading behind him. You can see information about people as well as you go through these things. So it's not like it's um, hard. And the, and the people that they read are usually people with very unusual last names. A lot of them are women. They're all almost all women, by the way. It is totally female-oriented. Um, and so a lot of them are like hyphenated last names, which includes your maiden name. So it makes it all that much more easier to look up your obituaries that you might be included in. Very simple to do. And again, they're only looking for about 10. And if they don't find something with that person, then they look for somebody else. It's really not difficult. Well, do, they, do people register in advance? Yes, register? yes. Oh, okay. They're registering in advance. So if you go to their Facebook page, which is wide open, we do that all the time also. So this is one thing, right? So you got adults paying 20 bucks a person or whatever. I think it's a, I think it's a shame and I think it's wrong, but you know, they're adults. So what am I going to say about that? It's, it's, I can point it out and I can explain it and I can, you know, show it, but I don't want to shame the people. So we always conceal their identities, but it's not my business necessarily. But what crosses the line is when he's going to do readings for children. So Thomas John decided that he was going to do uh, psychic readings for children ages 5 to 12, a small group of eight, $400 each. So this was going to be April 19, 2021. So I was furious. And everybody who saw it was like, what the heck? We can't allow that. I mean, that's wrong. We couldn't get it canceled. We could not get it canceled. We, this was, I think, announced in December of 2020, something like that. So we tried everything we could think of to get it canceled, and we couldn't get it canceled. Anybody know Steve Novella from the Neurologic, uh, whatever his blog is, the SGU and uh, Science-Based Medicine. So I reached out to Steve, and I said, hey, can you do something? I thought maybe they would listen to a Yale professor, a neurologist. Maybe that would have some weight. So Steve Novella wrote a really nice article talking about the dangers of giving readings to children and trying to encourage them to go into mediumship, people, children who've had parents and stuff that have died recently and now they're whatever so he didn't so Thomas John it didn't do anything for it he got all upset and he's like you know I'm just they're just spiritual people so you know whatever so he read the article but it didn't shut him down so what ended up happening is I needed to get in and attend because it was going to happen and I'm not going to go into detail on this because I have a very long article and there's many articles out on it it's the last thing I did and it's the last thing I'm going to do for a while because I've caught these people so many times that we have to have the media to come in and start doing something. Because I can preach to the choir till I'm blue in the face, but it isn't, it's having an impact on their business. It really is. But it's not having a fast impact on their business like I would like to. So, um, I didn't, so we did attend. There's several twists at the end. Um, it was very interesting. I have... Uh, the reading's all broken down. It's a very long article because I want the children when they grow up. Hi, kids, if you're watching. Um, he was lying to you the whole time. Um, so so the, the children, the eight children that attended will maybe someday want to know what happened. And it, it's all there for them. I broke it down in detail. So it is detailed. Also, it's in detail because I want skeptic groups to understand you guys can do this too. You know, it's not like... I'm so brilliant or anything. So the article is called Operation Onion Ring. You can find it. There's videos. I've done lectures on just Operation Onion Ring, and I reveal what happens if you don't want to read the whole article. But there's a lot of information about this, but that's what it is, Thomas, John, and the children. So I'm going to switch hats, I think. Well, not literally. Um, and I'm going to talk about guerrilla skeptics, because this is a whole different branch that has really nothing to do with the guerrilla skeptics. It's an entirely different group of people, and these are people who are, who are working to change Wikipedia for the better. So I have a large group of people who do, who do this, 
Uh, many in this room are also my editors. Uh, we just had our 12th anniversary a couple weeks ago. I was flying from, from California to Washington, D.C., so I completely forgot to make a big deal out of it. We had 12, 12 years. Um, um, it was created by me as a group. We meet on Facebook. We have a secret cabal. It is known. It is called the secret cabal. It's hidden. You can't get there. And what we've done is we've trained people from all over the world to edit Wikipedia pages that are uh, concerning science, scientific skepticism, or claims of the paranormal, and we work in all languages. We train. Um, it takes about four months to train. It's, it's an involved process, and if you want to talk to me later, if you want to join, I'm happy to send you the information. You can also talk to Adrian, or you could talk to Romero, or Jeff, or him back in the back. Or, you know, you could talk to people about this. We're all, we're all in this little world that they've gone through the training and so, and so on. So we have been existing for 12 years. 45% of the pages we write are in languages outside of English, because I feel very passionate about getting information outside of America. So it's like, the, it's like COVID vaccines. We can vaccinate America, wonderful. But this is going to keep occurring until we can vaccinate the world, right? So you have to get the information out there in languages people want to read. We have to get it to places where people can, can, can get the information. So um, we've been focusing on this for a very long time. And um, we can't, I like projects where you have an end date. You know how you're doing. Where are you going with this project? You know, are you successful? And with Wikipedia, it's very difficult. We can't say, well, done. we're done when we finish Wikipedia. I mean, <laughs> that isn't going to happen. But um, we have ways of measuring it the best of our ability. We have a, a program that was built for me, a software program, and Jeff is running it now. It's called Stat Badger. You can't see it. It's only for our team. But it allows us to keep track of how many times a Wikipedia page is viewed. Now, we can't know if that Wikipedia page is viewed by the same person over and over. We can't know if the person was there for two seconds and jumped off. We can't know if they read the whole page. But it's, it's the best we have is that tool. So we're able to keep track of the stats of the pages we wrote. And we write far, we, we, we um, edit far more pages than we than, than are in our stat badger. We're constantly editing and creating things and improving things. Uh, we've written, as of this morning, we've written 2,045 pages. I wrote it on my hand. So we've written 2,045 pages to date this morning was the last one. And those 2,400 pages, 45 pages have been viewed 113 million times. So we know we're having an impact because people are, are reading this and they're getting information. We also know that the media is accessing the, the Wikipedia pages because we'll find quotes almost directly in media articles that are taken right from our Wikipedia pages. We've written 104 Wikipedia pages concerning vaccines. People who are disinformation, you know, anti-vaxxers, or the organizations they represent. We've written pages about trimerosol. We've written about COVID. We've written about a lot of things that have to do with vaccines. Even the people who invented the vaccines that have saved our lives. So we've written 104 pages of, uh, on vaccines, and those have just been viewed just over 5 million times. Yeah, that's right, 5 million times. <laughs> so, <laughs> wake you up. So we, are, we know we're having an effect. And we've got all kinds of projects. We work on UFO pages. We work on all kinds of stuff. And I have something for you, too. Because today, my hosts, uh, Faith and Romero, took Adrian and I. Adrian is touring with me. She's only touring the first three stops. She came in from Calgary to Boston to be with her son. And then she flew over to Washington, D.C. And then she's just joined me on tour. We really haven't met each other much except on Zoom before. So we went to, um, so after this, we're going to Buffalo, New York to go to uh, CFI headquarters, and I'm going to give you a talk there on Friday. But um, we're touring. I want to see stuff. You know, I love history. I love all this thing. So we've been kind of going around. We went to a graveyard today, and, you know, as people do. Um, <laughs> we went to the History Museum. You guys have a lovely state, and the history is really interesting. And it looks like they're doing a really good job, uh, you know, telling history. So today we went, and they took me to the graveyard, like I said. And they also took me to, um, where was that place, McCulloch? Mordecai? Mordecai, Mordecai Park. Park. Mordecai House. Mordecai House, yeah. So we toured down. We saw the, all that cool. It was really fun. 
So while I was getting ready to come here, like about an hour before I got here, I uploaded a couple photos I took because I realized that the Wikipedia pages for these a couple places didn't have good pictures on them. Now I know you're not going to like this person, but I thought I'd, I'd just tell you that at this place, um, we noticed that his he's buried there. I'd never heard of the guy before. He's one of your governors, uh, a confederate. Um, just saying, say no more. But um, I noticed that he didn't have that he was buried there because the Wikipedia page for the cemetery had like notable people who had died there, and and we said, oh, let's find his grave. Or I think Adrian was wandering around, and she said, oh, look at this is the governor. And so I went over and I took a picture. So what I did is I just uploaded the photo. And these are the small things that people could do. You don't have to be a member of our group. It's just easier because we train you. And then I put this picture up today. I just did that right. They don't even know I did it. So, um, and Adrian took a lot of photos so we could do something else later. But I just thought I'd put it up. Just for training. Just for training. Yeah, we teach people how to, tr we teach people how to edit so we have that photos to have them teach. So this is the tombstone of, of the governor. <coughs> it wasn't there until about an hour and a half ago. <coughs> and the cemetery had a picture right here that was like a picture of tombstones. And I was like, well, that's not very good. So Romero stopped the car. I got out and took a picture of the, of the archways, you know, and the entrance. I said, OK, main picture. So I put it on the main picture just before I got here. So I thought, these are the kinds of things we can do to improve Wikipedia, you know, obscure museums, uh, people who are in the media. There's so much that we can do as a collective, as I said, that don't have to join my team. We can show you how, but lots of people do it. So I'm nearly done with my presentation. So those of you who haven't ordered, more than welcome to order. But I want to show you something that um, I'm really large, very, very happy about making sure that we all get together and try to try to network. Because that's how we really get somewhere. You know, we network with each other, you get to know each other, you share a beer or a coffee or whatever, and we we make connections. And that's how we are building our community so we can do more. So that's why I really like to come out to these smaller groups, because it's more intimate. You can ask me thousands of questions. Um, I'll make something up. But um, one of the things that's coming up, and I, this is the group that, one of the groups that I'm involved in, this is the Bay Area Skeptics out in California. We put on a conference every year. Last year we did it over Zoom. This year we're doing it over Zoom again. It's sponsored by the Monterey County Skeptics, Bay Area Skeptics, Sacramento, Sacramento, Sacramento Area Skeptics. And this is online. It's $20.22, three days. I'm going to hold trivia. There's like a Jeopardy category thing that I can't really tell you who's going to be in it, but I think it might be Bill Nye um, <laughs> and a couple other people. And so these are some of the speakers that will be there. I'm going to be holding trivia. I also, that's how I know Faith and Romero. They joined my trivia team. I play trivia on Zoom every Thursday. Just telling you, it goes late, but man, it's fun. And people have gotten to know each other really well from trivia. We've never missed a game, and we just had our 102nd game. And we were only going to do one. And then everybody kept coming back. Oh, we're doing this next Thursday? I guess so. OK. The things you do, and they just end up becoming successful. So this is some of the people who will be talking. It's at uh, Skeptical 22. Again, it's online. It's in July. Sign up for it. Even if you can't attend online at the moment, you'll have access to the videos for six months. And then they'll make them live. The other thing I really want to make sure that you guys are aware of is SciCon. I love SciCon. This is the biggest conference that, that we have in the United States. It's, it's run by Center for Inquiry or the Skeptical Inquirer group that I'm a fellow of, so I'm obviously biased. I will be speaking at this. I know who's speaking in the future, but I can't tell you. But it's going to be a blast. You guys are going to love this. So SciCon is held in Las Vegas. Um, they always hold it in Vegas because it's inexpensive for people to fly in and get hotels. This will be in late October. If you can go and you want to reach out to me and I can help maybe help you find roommates or what to do, how to go, who to, whatever. I've done every one, uh, I've done a lot of these and before that I used to attend all the TAMs. So the, the amazing meetings by James Randi. So I just want to push that. And this is my last slide if you wanted to take a picture of it or whatever so that you know that you can visit my website. Everything that I've put on, I've talked about, and a thousand things more are on the abouttimeproject.org. You can learn about Monterey County Skeptics if you're going to come out to Monterey. We do a skeptic camp every year in January. Um, we have uh, all sorts of interviews I've done with people, famous speakers, famous in our world. And there are also all the articles about skeptics, uh, psychics, we, uh, and all the other things I'm, I'm involved in. And I do have 
um, stickers for you guys if you want them. And I have my business cards, and it has me in Bigfoot, so you know it's that's real. And if you want to ask questions, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so we're going to do Q&A. And I will be happy to answer questions later, but he's going to make him answer the question. So he's already, for the two people around the room, he's already asked me these questions that I'm thinking about. Uh, chicken related questions, yeah. <laughs> Not chicken for the audio, for the, you're, well, on, you're on. Okay, no well, pressure. The the, well, the first simple question was um, I, I love the analysis that was done um, looking at psychic ability or inability to predict COVID and, and the pandemic. Has a similar analysis been done looking back at 9 11? No. And okay. the reason is, <laughs> and the reason is, I mean, there might have been people, whatever. But when I thought of doing this for the COVID, uh, the person who edits, you know, who goes through my edits, uh, Barry Carr said, that's brilliant. I don't know why we never thought of doing that before. And he would know if it had been done before because there's only so many people who do this kind of stuff. And also in 2001, social media wasn't necessarily the thing it is now. Yes, Adrian. she has an answer for you, except for the Psychic Prediction Project, the Australian Psychic Prediction Project, which you can read all about from Richard Saunders um, in Australia. We had a 21-year um, uh, examination of all claims made by all psychics in Australia. He spent 15 years going through all of the... Uh, looking at YouTube, all the magazines, which a lot of them were women's magazines, and he looked at every claim, and he screenshot everything, and he put it in this really complicated spreadsheet, <laughs> and then he had to go through and evaluate each claim, and that was time-consuming. So what did he do? He said, Susan, I really need some help. So I put together a Zoom group, and Adrian was in it, and some other people, and every Tuesday we met for a couple hours, and we went through every claim, and we evaluated them, and guess what the percentage of a psychic getting right is? I'm going to guess no greater than 50. 11 percent. Or is it 11 percent? We call it the Saunders number. The Saunders, yeah. It's really small. Did any of the psychics get significantly higher than that? Like did somebody get eight? Maybe like 15. But he had people do random guesses beforehand. He's asking if there was anybody who did better than that. He had, he had years before he'd said, He'd asked a bunch of skeptics, give me your prediction for next year. And those people actually got like 30%. So, but anyway, you can read all about it. Read all about it. It's all over the place. They did look into 9-11. Was not predicted by any of those Australian skeptics. Because that's what we did at the end of it. We said, what should they have predicted? Like the Malaysian plane that fell, that, or 9-11, or, um, or things that should have been predicted. And we never found a psychic one of them, not a one of them. So in Australia, they suck. But maybe <laughs> maybe it's better in other areas. I don't know. But nobody's crazy enough to do that again. Nobody will do it. It took him forever to do this. It was so intense, the details. So check it out. The other question about chickens is what? <laughs> <laughs> I think something's being projected onto me. Um, so the, the other question is sort of same question, two parts. Have you ever done, uh, recorded a public demonstration uh, you know, it begins by saying, what I'm about to tell you, you could do, there's nothing psychic, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to do what's called cold and hot reading and then do it and show how that actually works. And then, but then the better part would be turning this into a TV show where weekly or monthly, and, and there's got to be a lot of TV channels, someone who would, who would pick this up where you or someone else demonstrates non-psychism, whatever the right word is. Non-psychism? Yeah. Oh, by the way, you got a little chicken something. No, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we, we have we a chicken have farm. Yeah, we, he's got a chicken that's farm. All that's off, really cool. Off, off tape, yeah. That's really cool. So, yes, I haven't done a lot of any demonstrations. I'm not an expert. Hot reading, every detail is in all the articles. I show the screenshots. I, I blur out people's names and things like that, but it, ooh, I've done a ton of that. Um, my boyfriend, Mark Edward, is, does demonstrations all the time on hot and cold reading. We go and we tour all over the place. We did we did New Zealand, we did Australia, all over New Zealand and Australia, well, all over Australia. We've done all over the place, UK and so on. And what he does is he opens up, he's, he's a professional, he's a mentalist, a performing mentalist. He opens up the show and he goes around and he does hot readings. Because we've already hot read everybody who's going to go. Because you guys put on Meetup, you're going to attend, right? And some of the people have Facebook pages. So we just hot read you. We figure out what high school you went to because you've got it on your page. We know when your birthday is because somebody's wishing you happy birthday. And then we go and figure out what day your birthday was, a Monday. We'll say, hey, your birthday was a Monday. And you're like, 
oh yeah, it was. Uh, and I see your brother has got a new job or whatever. So we go through and we do the whole audience reading and then he kind of, re then I come on and then I kind of explain how it's done. So we do that all the time. Lots of people in the skeptic world have done this. Come on in. Lots of skeptics in this world have done this. Hot readings explained over and over and over and cold reading and over and over. What we hear from the believers are they don't want to read it. They don't want to know about it. Number one, that's what they tell us. Or, yeah, that one's a fraud, but not my psychic. My psychic is, there's no way they could have known. So we get that constantly. Uh, we also get, um, they just don't want to know. I mean, Thomas John um, has done everything he can to keep me quiet, not keep me quiet, but not to mention my name. He's always frustrated. He lashes out on Facebook and says, there's this woman, she's like a cat fiend, and she's like, all these things, and one day she showed up for an event, and she had pretended she had a dead child, and I did. It was Operation Bumblebee. It was the first one I did, and it had nothing to do with psychic, I mean, uh, food, but I showed up with a picture of my son, and then I said to his manager that my son had died at four, and I had a fake name and fake Facebook pages, and the psychic, Chip Coffee was his name, talked about my son, so my son was in the audience, actually, sitting behind me, but um, the... Uh, the thing is, is that um, they just aren't going to go there. So, but Thomas John will mention me every so often, but he doesn't want to mention my name anymore because what happens is his friends, his believers go, I think he's talking about this article. I just Googled her and I came up with this New York Times article and then it kind of backfires on him because you don't want me to know, them to know about me. Your third question was what? Something about, oh, a TV show. Have you ever done that and then turned it into a TV show? But yeah. I thought of the fourth question now. Oh. I hope that your next uh, project will be called Project Barbecue in honor of your visit here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, okay, Project Barbecue. Well, it might be a while. We have one planned called Operation Lima Bean, but we haven't. We ha it's all planned, but we haven't. We I'm not doing it until I have big media. Yes. Okay. Er earlier, you talked about um, psychics who could read the audience, as it were find out personal things about the audience. How many of those people claim to be able to know the future? To me, those are completely separate things. You could know one and not the other. And they go all no over. They go psychic. Okay, so they, they, okay. they, you know, they say that they're not, uh, you know, some of them aren't known to be healers or to know about your psychic abilities, like your, where you're sick at. But then they, they, they're not going to, wherever they can take an edge, they're going to go there. So if it's, um, you know, I hear that you have some heart, I think you should go check out your heart because there's some kind of, you know, it's not, it doesn't look like it's serious, but I would have your doctor check you out. So they'll say, I don't do medical questions or anything like that, but then they go right into the medical stuff. Or, you know, they'll say, I don't predict the future, but then they start predicting the future. They're just, they're just making it up as they go, but that's their schlick. Some of them are really focused on an area and some of them are more focused on the other area, but they'll, they'll take any hit they can get. Edwards on the TV show, he used to say, anyone can do this. Oh, I know. So Isn't that a great? a good example of what you're saying. That anyone Anybody could do, could do this. And like I said, if you're in sales, you do cold reading. That's just the way it is. The TV show ideas, um, we run into, every time I do an article that hits the big media, they, they come to me and they say, oh, my God, this is, a gr this is amazing. We have to do a show with you. And then we meet with these people, and they sit down and they go, and then they realize they can't do it because, number one, you're going to get sued. They don't want to do the big names, people who are currently in a business. They don't want to do it. Also, there's a competition because they're on TV networks that we'd be showing it on. They don't want to do anything. They want to do either psychics who have been busted or are dead. If the psychic's in jail, they want to do it. If they're dead, they want to do it, but they don't want to do it with me. Yes? You know, James Randi does a cold reading, and the result is that the audience thinks he's psychic. Yeah, and that is true. There's yes. No, there's no skeptic. Even if you say, audience. if you say to the audience ahead of time, "This is just a trick," he's there. Their people will believe that it's not a trick. And, and maybe, Houdini, same thing. Yeah, and so maybe we're focused too much on get on exposing the psychics rather than doing what was it Michael Shermer why people believe weird things. What can we do about why people believe weird things? Well, that's, a, that's true. We have to take that's a multi-pronged... Because they will always be psychics. 
What Probably. Do we do about the, why do people want to believe in weird things? Well, we have to take a multi-pronged attack on it. Some people are going to write the academic journals and, and, and articles and the books like Michael Shermer, but the believers are not going to be reading that. That's not, they're not going there. What we have to do, my, my approach is that I need to make it as uncomfortable as possible for the psychic to stay in business by drawing as much attention to them. They do not want sunshine on their, on their actions. And the work that I've done so far gets out into the media and they end up getting their events canceled sooner, they have less people to show up, there's a lot more ridicule, people are able, anytime they're in the media's eye, they get Googled, they're gonna get one of my articles. The other, and we've seen their rates of their, uh, uh, their Zoom events go down to like $8 in some cases. The other thing is, is that it's not about, so much about convincing people about psychics, but it, what's really important is to inoculate people ahead of time and not just psychics but with everything same with vaccines and all the other things we've been going through but if you talk to people before they're in grief before they're super lonely before they've had a child abducted or whatever if you explain to them the tricks of the trade and they understand what hot reading and cold reading is and how manipulative these people are they're just they're they're grief vampires they will hook onto you and drain everything they possibly can out of you. If it's publicity, if it's money, whatever they can. So what happens is if you have explained this to groups and people you leave and you go and you tell your neighbors or whatever, I had this, I went to this talk today, this lady's talking about the psychic stuff and then you get into a conversation with your neighbor and you kind of explain what happens. If they end up in that environment where this is something that they start to see, they're gonna be forewarned and they will have better, better information, they're less likely to fall for it. Whereas, if you try to take somebody who's already in grief, who's already been giving money to psychics, you're not gonna convince them. So I totally understand what you're going from. It's low-hanging fruit, but we gotta start somewhere because we haven't even gotten the low-hanging fruit yet. It's still sitting there waiting to be picked. We haven't taken care of that. We gotta get to the big stuff, but before we can get to the big stuff, we gotta get the little stuff. Other questions? So I, I, I love your question, Bill. I think that's great because it extends just beyond one particular psychic to all psychics. But I, I'm, I'm reading something even beyond that, which is maybe the idea is not so much to inoculate against psychics or, you know, we're protecting you from something bad. It's teaching skepticism. Why do you believe anything? How do you even, even good stuff. Why do you believe think, in yeah. vaccines? Why do you believe your car should go to a mechanic, you know, why? So it's, it's not just why do we believe weird things? Why do we believe anything? And then that's building on the base the person already has. Right. Education is so important and get them as little, as young as you possibly can is the best thing we could do, but I have no power. The I word, have zero power to do that. The word skeptic has a negative yes. connotation. That's the word we're using because there ain't a better <laughs> word. We have this and argument at every skeptic yeah, event I've I ever know, done and it devolves into it's fighting. the same thing as a cynic. And a yeah. cynic is a, is a depressing person. I love the and word skeptic, skeptic, though. I use it all the time. Right. I, I love it. But we're not trying to convince you. Right? No, but <laughs> what happens is when I get in an elevator at a conference and I'm attending a skeptic event, they go, what's this? Mm -hmm. And we say, I'm a scientific skeptic along the reins of uh, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, mm -hmm. Houdini, James Randi. And then they say, oh, really? You know, depending how far, how long the elevator ride is, you can have a little more. <laughs> Sometimes you're done in a couple seconds. And they say, and then you could say, you know, most people are skeptic about something. You know, you're not going to buy a car that's got an odometer reading of, you know, this amount on it because you're going to be a little skeptical about this old car with this very small odometer reading. So skepticism is the word that we use because everything else is awful. And, and if you want to call yourself something else, that's great. I call myself, sometimes I say I'm a science activist. The words you use are important, and it Critical may be thinker? time to find a better word. There isn't. We've been discussing this for generations. Right. Even, you know, bright. How about bright? <laughs> but yeah, so it's a it's a conversation that's devolved into just almost duking it out in some places. Uh, this is a little baby a tangent, but sure. I was going to ask about climate skeptics. Yes. I was going to change the word to climate deniers, but since you brought it up. Mm -hmm. What is what is your what is going on now with climate deniers? Are they giving up? 
No, no, no. They're still <laughs> around. Um, they, you know, of course they've gotten to their to their, you know, they're getting where they go. But it's, you know, the vac. I think COVID has kind of overshadowed a lot of that. You know, it's been interesting. Up right there. Uh, let me finish my thought. But the yeah, you don't hear the, it, you the don't, word climate right. skeptic and all vaccine skeptics and all that is obviously a word that happens, but. Again, I think it's an educational thing you could say. Somebody, when I go and I'm appearing somewhere, like if I'm at a taxi and they go, what are you here in town for? I'm gonna be giving a talk to the triangle area of skeptics. Oh, what's that? Then you say triangle, well, skepticism is just a way of thinking about the world. We need evidence for claims of the paranormal. We're more like Carl Sagan, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And, and then I'll say, sometimes I'll say, we have nothing to do with vaccine skeptics or climate change skeptics. Uh, it's just. I like the word because it allows you to have a conversation with somebody. It, it's not like a one word thing they know, like atheist. Okay, we kind of know what that is. But it's it doesn't stop the conversation. You're able to have a little more conversation. Uh, I like that, I agree. Yeah. It's, it just, it's just conversational. Yes, Brian? Well, let's follow up on what you said. What is the best experimental mm -hmm. test of anthropogenic climate change? No idea. Okay. You don't have another planet in which to test it. So there is no experimental test. No. I'm a manager of people. I don't need to know that stuff. So, Any other questions? You're building a case. Yes, Paul. I have a oh, give him the mic. So kind of how like the um, folks have co-opted the word skeptic for vaccine skepticism mm -hmm. and climate skepticism, like you were just saying, Jim. Um, and you were explaining before about how you've done demos to uh, show how cold readings and hot readings can be done. What if we just co-opt the word psychic and you say like <laughs> we're, we're we're scientific we're scientific psychics, and you know what I mean? And, and we can you might have started something, Paul. You no, know you, you like we can write like how-to guides, websites, and like show people empower people to be able to do it themselves. Well, you know yeah, that's I mean? great. And co-op, so that word <laughs> psychic kind of, we, we have to take it off its pedestal, right? That's good, but it is, psychics and mentalism are the same kind of thing. One's pretending to be a psychic and using mentalism, which is magic, and others are, the mentalists and the psychics are kind of the same world, but that's really clever. I haven't but heard that before. That's a good idea. I'm not familiar with the word mentalist. Oh, it's a magician who pretends to be a psychic. I'm just saying, like, oh, yeah. is it much more, everybody has their Right. Like, I like that idea. Mentalism, uh, do you know who Banachek is? No. He's the head of the James Randi Educational Foundation president. He's a, he's a mentalist. Um, uh, James Randi himself was a magician. Yeah. So he, but a psychic, a person who does magic, it's like a wing of magic that is. Um, Darren Brown. Darren Brown, yeah. He's, a, he's more mentalist. But a, a mentalist is somebody who's more likely to look like they're getting the trick. Like a, a magician is pulling a rabbit out of the hat or turning a ribbon green to whatever, cutting up ropes. But a mentalist is doing it with the power of their mind. They look real. So, so how good are you at trivia? Very, I, I, I organize it. I'm not great at Yes, sir. Uh, Matt? Yeah, so these people that you're going after, is it more so that because like you believe psychics don't exist and they're doing this, or is it more they're scammers but they're using psychics as their scamming ability? Like, are you more coming at them because of the psychic angle or the scamming angle? It's a good question. Um, or both. You know, some of the psychics don't have anything to do with money. They're 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 trying to get a hook. Like the people who have missing children. Uh, they will try, they will say, I never charge for somebody who has a missing child. And they're, they go overboard talking about it. So it's not, it has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with um, the media is following around the family who has a missing child. And if the psychic can give enough BS 
and throw out enough stuff, something's going to hit when the when the child is found, either alive or dead. Yeah. They, they're going to say, I'm seeing the number 74, 74. And then they also throw in out a lot of other numbers. But when the child is found and it's near a house and the house number is 7456 or whatever, I did it. And then the media will take advantage of it. So in a lot of ways, they will they'll glom on for the publicity because it's, it's going to tie to money. So I'm more interested personally in the emotional manipulation of people's memories and how, and like in a grief vampire way, they're really harming these people's memories of people and, and glomming onto them. The money is, so they're scammers, yes, in my opinion. Um, and I think if it wasn't psychics, they would do something else. Exactly, I, yeah. I think they would go for whatever it took, but that just happened to be their area. But yeah, a lot of the things that some of these people do, it could it could translate to another kind of scam, multi-level marketing or insurance fraud or Lord knows anything. Um, vaccine, you know, selling COVID cures that are fake or, yeah. Yeah, cause, so I guess the second part to that question is, uh, I mean, I don't really have very strong opinions on psychics. It's not something I've thought much about. But if they did really, like if someone had a psychic ability, I doubt they would be like on Zoom calls with people doing these sorts of think, things, right? Yeah. They would be doing something else. I think they'd be mentally ability. ill on the street talking to themselves. Uh, yeah, like I don't think that that would be something you could be saying. Type. Yeah, I yeah. don't think there would be any way you could. They would be hiding in a, I think, if you could see dead people and talk to them, and talk about the grandmas. I think they would be in the cabin in the mountain, living, sustaining, and nowhere near people because that way they could have a, like a peaceful life. But I agree. I don't think they would be. I don't think they'd be on a Zoom call. They weren't. Certainly would not be at the hotel Motel Six down there convention doing a, a talk with 50 people in a room. They'd be. The government would know about them. Mark Edward always says this. He says they would be the most powerful person on the planet. They would be in the CIA or whatever the equivalent of that is in a locked room in a bunker somewhere with wires coming out of their heads. I did that, sorry, with my mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's another Mark Edward line. Uh, that's an Uri Geller line. Anything, any, he'd take advantage of it. Yeah, so there's another one. God, man, I hate it when I keep doing that. The things are falling off the wall, people can't see. But um, yeah, so if you were if you were really psychic, you would be the most powerful the person. That's probably gonna fall off the wall, so I would just take it off. Yeah. They're plastic. Okay. If we concentrate, maybe they'll go back the other way. Did I answer your question okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes? I, I just, I think it's really great the way you took out the child. Oh my gosh, that was awful. I mean, you, you really, you I mean, wait till you read that article, or no, did you read I, I did, it? I did. Oh, you read, read the, the article? article? Yeah, I did. You don't want to tell anybody the twist, because that would be giving no, me but away. No, but you... Did you see the twist coming? You took it so seriously, and I, I think that's admirable. Well, thank really you. I appreciate great. that. And I put that together in four days. The first thing I did, Operation Bumblebee, it took us about six months. Um, I think Operation uh, Ice Cream Cone took a couple months to do, and then when I got to this one, I've done them so many times, different kinds, but this one took four days. It, it, I had to. Yes, absolutely. We were trying to cancel it, and it wouldn't cancel. Okay, I guess I'd just like to ask if there's anybody doing any systematic way of trying to get critical thinking into our educational system. Because I, I feel like, you know, you'll hear educators saying, oh, we, we won't like critical thinking. But as far as I can tell, it means the English teacher says you ought to think about what the author was trying to say. You know, but the fact is that much of the problems in the world are caused by people who sincerely believe things that are wrong. Right. And yet there's no place in our education, or at least I, I don't see it, that, that actually says, look, you know, here are all the things you have to watch out for. And there's a zillion of them. I mean, there's not just the psychics, but you know, you have all uh, commercial advertising, political advertising, Absolutely. and fooling yourself. You know, there's sensationalism. You believe things that are, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, is. <laughs> Is there any hope that this will get into our education? Okay, so I have an answer for you. Many people in the skeptic community have classes that are critical thinking classes. A lot of it is aimed at the college um, universities because it's really hard to get them into the lower levels, which I think we should start out in kindergarten, to be honest with you. I mean, it should be the basics. Um, and there are people who have some high school classes 
And if you attend things like SciCon, you will meet a lot of people. And there's other conferences all over the world that are wonderful. Um, uh, but uh, so there are some teachers who are doing this and they have critical thinking skills. There's other organizations like the James Randi Educational Foundation. Brian Dunning has uh, educational things for teachers to be able to download for free uh, for classrooms. Um, uh, the CFI that, um, uh, that sponsors uh, SciCon, they have educational stuff. At the last SciCon, which was 2019 because it was all canceled because of the pandemic, I uh, raised $4,000 amongst people who were going to attend and we got a school bus and we got 19 high schoolers uh, to attend Friday. So they were able to sit down with, um, they, a few of them attended the lunch with Michael Mann, the climate scientist, and a couple of the uh, students asked questions of the climate scientists. Um, we, they interacted, they got Skeptical Inquirer magazines. Uh, and then several people in, that I asked, could you, you know, volunteer, like Kenny Biddle and Stuart Weiss and um, a few other people. We went to the school and we did little presentations in the classroom, high school level. So this is happening but it's happening here and there. Um, I, I can't even imagine how we would go about getting that done, but dang it, we gotta get that done. You have a question? You know something about that, Paul? So it's gotta be done, but I don't think we have the motivation yet to do it in golf like we really need to. Yeah, it's more of a, um, a, a thought about that question. Um, we have to figure out a way to make it profitable. <laughs> because, I mean, to, this is a cynical part of me, but it's also true. So uh, there's a lot of political um, will to discourage critical thinking oh, for yeah. obvious reasons. Right. So we and we and we, we we can't fight that with logic, right? Like because we because we, we know that's not going to work, uh, and we can't fight it with appeals to emotion. So it has to be we have to figure out some way to, you know, like incentivize it really. Maybe, well, maybe we can. Lawsuits do work. You know, we've, yeah. uh, 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 CFI is now suing Boron and CVS and Walmart for, for homeopathy oh. in the school. So, uh, and, and it's court case right now going on. It's in the appeals process in um, the state of uh, Washington, D.C. So it's happening. You know, I can say Washington here and nobody reacts. I love it. <laughs> no, I heard that. Because you're in the I South. I'm in the South, that. right? Yeah. So my, like, my mom's from Arkansas, and so I learned how to say it that way. But if I'm in California, nobody stops going, oh, my gosh, she just said Washington. With a, <laughs> but thank you. I, I'm with my people. Okay, go ahead. So, I'm, I'm, I mean, just, Sorry to, to distract, but. just to wrap that up, that goes back to what you're saying about the multi-pronged approach. So I think lawsuits, like, are a disincentive. Um, for pseudoscience, but if we can also find a way to incentivize critical thinking in science, then all the better. Yeah, we it, it's got to be multi-pronged. I, I don't have the answer. All I know is that there are a lot of people who really, we, we all agree, we just don't know how because we're, we're dealing with a lot of problems. But in some countries, they do it well. I think in the Scandinavian countries, they really teach critical thinking young. I believe Australia and New Zealand do as well. Canada's getting better. Canada, oh, we have a representative from Canada here today. Teacher. She's a math teacher, so, you know, quadratic equation and all. Uh, there's also Wikipedia and the Wikipedia oh, project. Oh, thank you. There's uh, the Wikipedia project. That really, thank you, Romero, who's, who's got to finish his training or I'm going to strangle him. But um, <laughs> I love you. Um, so uh, <laughs> so uh, Wikipedia, absolutely. Wikipedia is written at the level of a high school reader. That's kind of where we're at. There's also other things that you can do to, um, because a lot of people go to Wikipedia first to get a lot of information. You're sent there. We know it's the biggest website, almost the biggest website in the world. Um, we know it's going to help. We also know that people read Wikipedia and then disseminate it to people. You know, if your neighbor said, or if you're talking to your brother-in-law about something, he may have read it on Wikipedia. He just doesn't say I read it on Wikipedia. If you're arguing with your coworker about something, and then you're talking to him about it, they go home and they get their information from Wikipedia. We know that because it's just that's how we do it as a society. There's people who are growing up now that have never not known Wikipedia, which is really fascinating to me. It's 21 years, I think it's been around, right? 21 years, something like that. So it's people that's never ever not known Wikipedia. So it's powerful. 
And if we can't get that under control as skeptics, all the rules are the rules of skepticism. It is a skeptical site. You have to have a back. You have to back up everything with citation. The citation needs to be from a reliable source. On and on and on. It is the dream of skeptics, yet we haven't fully taken on advantage of it. I'm the first person that's put together a team that does this. And to do it in languages other than English, people think I'm nuts. But it's, there, I don't think there's any, she goes, oh, I agree. I agree. <laughs> I don't think anybody's ever tried anything like this before. But it's working. But it's slow. It takes months to train an editor. And editors have lives. So, you know, you, you work out with a page. Adrian has written, her first page she ever wrote was Haunted House. The, and then she wrote Spirit Photography. She's wrote an anti-vaxxers page. And on and on and on. So I mean, there's a lot of pages that, that are getting a lot of views. How many views? Uh, 750,000. Oh wow. 750,000 views that's for her that's seven that's pages. Wow. So think about it. You know, that's education. So this is, it isn't the solution, but damn it, it's a good try, right? You know, what are you gonna do? So of course I'm looking for editors, and I'm happy. You, you, can, you have to be on Facebook. Yes. Yeah. You gotta have have Jeff's little thingy toy, new toy. You say you guys edit and write your own Wikipedia pages. Uh, I mean, one of the big problems with Wikipedia is like biases and missing information, and among other things. How do you know when you guys are like doing your own changes to the Wikipedia pages that you aren't introducing biases or missing information from your own perspectives? Hand the mic over to Adrian. Let's have her answer it because she's sitting there going, right, I said, right, good question. Good so, question. Really so good let's question. hear your answer, Adrian. Uh, it is policed by other editors. So it is very difficult to write an article, especially when you're new, not to have your bias come through. And one of the advantages of having the cabal is you post it's seriously it. called the cabal, it is, really. It's a secret cabal. It's a joke kind of. Yeah, because it was not so, we call it the not so secret secret cabal. And we, we, we post our article prior to posting it onto Wikipedia for them, everyone to look at. And for example, my Christiane Northrup page, who is an anti-vaxxer and among other crazy stuff. And I was told it was a hit piece and I had to pull it back. And as a result, when I posted it, very few changes happened. So we have this team that helps us rein in our biases because it is, a, it is an issue. And you're, not, you're supposed to write on Wikipedia in a neutral way. And it, it can be hard. And I'm finally feeling like I'm getting pretty good at it now. But if it is really biased, it will get taken down. Or edited. On, or edited by yeah. another, another. There's so many people looking at the pages that it's very hard to get by with anything. Yeah, and within minutes. Like, it happens usually very, very quickly because there's so many editors that are looking all the time. Not even, not necessarily our editors. Yeah. And so what they do is uh, we also have to use reliable sources. So we can't use a website. We can't use a blog. It has to be. Can't use Facebook, you know, yeah, Twitter. Yeah, we have the, the citations yeah. we're using have to be from reliable sources. Like Skeptical Inquire is a great source for um, fringe. We call it fringe, paranormal mm -hmm. beliefs, because the people who are writing the articles are supposed to be experts in their field. So it's 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 involved. It's a little kind of hard to explain, but yes, we're aware of that, and um, we've we do the best we can, and so far it's pretty damn good. Yeah, I hope that answered your Adrian, question. I think he has a question here. No, I, I just want to follow up with one, one comment. So, yeah, just to, um, on the trail of that, uh, um, when you're looking at a Wikipedia page, any page, if you look at the top, kind of left, you see a tab that says talk. Go to that talk page. <laughs> um, that's, that's history. That's a history. The talk page is it's you, on the left. you get to see the back and forth between the editors. And that sometimes is longer than the page itself. And like, you you can't imagine the level of detail. These guys go and people go into back and forth and back and forth. Um, and another great thing about Wikipedia is um, all the revisions are changed. So you can always go back and look to see what this page looked like last week, last month, last year. Five years ago, five yeah. Yeah, whatever, and, and they, um, and it tracks the IP address of where the change was made. So there's other um, um, journalism organizations that monitor uh, is ExxonMobil 
polishing up their own page a little too much. You know Scientology. What I mean? Scientology, Scientology was one. editing their pages and yeah, they got yeah. their IPs banned and stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. So the, the integrity of Wikipedia, I mean, like, like we're saying, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. It's getting better, too. Yeah. They're getting better and better with the bots and the things that are able to do. If you went into a Wikipedia page today and you tried to write the F word, like just like, you know, you just put it into the article somewhere, it'll probably be reverted in seconds because they're computer bots that go through and look for, for, for vandalism of that sort. Yeah, and, and it's common, the vandalism. I, I think it was my spirit photography page just recently in the talk pages, which we were just talking about, they, somebody put fried chicken randomly. In <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. And it got reverted within probably a minute. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Is that, the, is that the new app one? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no weird. idea. It was very weird. <laughs> people are odd, you know. We, we, we're talking about chicken, somebody yeah. from the south. There's a theme here. Yeah. Chicken, chickens. I love chickens. I really do. And actually, uh, Susan, I, first of all, uh, I don't know if we ever thanked you enough. Thank you very much for a great talk and oh, everything it. you do. And, and, and Thanks I'm not, for I, letting me come here. And I'm not trying to close things out, but I, but I think actually you have demonstrated the brilliant cold read, or you truly are psychic, in that you said that you name all of your projects after food, and I yet one of them is called bumblebee. And the only thing I can think of eats bumblebees are chickens. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did bumblebee before we thought it was a thing, just like my trivia. We thought it was going to be the only thing we'd ever do, so we just came up with a flippant name. And if you look up Operation Bumblebee, you'll find a military exercise in World War II. So we shouldn't have named it Bumblebee. So it was stupid. But I didn't know. No, I'm not psychic, so I didn't know it was going to be a thing. Yeah, so, we, so the first one was doesn't follow the pattern, but everything else follows the pattern of food. They're all easy to spell. Um, the reason why we do that is because we want people to be able to go, like if we... There's a lot of ways you can mess up a psychic show. You could show up with business cards or something and hand out just a piece of paper. Just hand out a piece of paper, the only thing on it. You go to Thomas John's show or go to Tyler Henry, the um, Hollywood medium, and just it says Operation Tater Tot and just hand it out to everybody. Somebody's going to go, what the heck is Operation Tater Tot? They're going to Google it. They're going to get all my articles. So everything has a name that's easy to remember so that if Scott, so if you have John, well, we didn't do Operation anything with John Edward. But if somebody came to town that we have done a sting on, you could you could just stand out in front and just hand out a piece of paper innocuously with all that says is that on there. And then people will be like curious. And they can throw the paper away. And later they can go, what was that Operation Ice Cream Cone thing about? And somebody will Google it and they'll find us. Plus we want to make sure that it's, it's ridiculous, the stuff we do. And so it's, it makes me laugh to know in that when I do media appearance, to have these people having to say Operation Onion Ring is hilarious. And it just makes, my, makes me glow. I will be around, so if you guys have questions, you want to talk to me privately or one of my other editors, you're more than welcome to do so. You have another question? Romero wants to say something about his training? <laughs> yeah, we had a one-on-one -on -one last night that we yeah. really worked on it. I mean, I'll say something about my training. Uh, oh, yeah, please. Bob Come over here in the camera more. Okay, so Bob mentioned that like we need to do more, put critical thinking into the schools. I think that's really hard because you have like in North Carolina, you have like a hundred counties. You have got to go to each county and talk to the school board to get the curriculum in there. But with Wikipedia, what I what I noticed was that you're kind of like sneaking in that critical thinking because you know we're writing the article and it's like. There's no evidence for this. There's no evidence for that, and uh, that you know, if a little kid is reading that, you know, they they're kind of picking up some of those critical thinking uh, steps from the article itself. So. And we, uh, I have one editor in in uh, Mexico, Ernesto, and um, his wife is a second grade teacher. So she tells him what she wants him to write Wikipedia pages in Spanish for because it's subject she's she's wow. doing. And so other teachers will do the same, and other people will, will do the same thing. They say, you know, we're covering such and such. You know they're using Wikipedia, right? So, I mean, it, you could tell people don't use Wikipedia. And it's a wonderful place to start. Go to the citations, you're going to do all right. 
but a lot of people, uh, um, teachers are using it, and the students are using it for background. So you might as well get the pages written well. We've got a lot of pages. I wanted to focus on this on uh, during the pandemic, and we just didn't get time to it. Anything that we thought would be school-aged, marine biology, fishes, anything that would be that a child would probably be looking up, we could get that written and translated and well written. Nice photos, because I like having photos. I'm a photographer by trade. I retired. But uh, photography, so that the kids are more interested in the page, they're more likely to spend more time on the page, and so on. Even your Confederate cemeteries here in North Carolina. <laughs> that was quite interesting. Nobody told me it was a Confederate um, cemetery until we looked at the Wikipedia page, which is called... They've hidden the name Confederate, by the way, on the Wikipedia page. It says, um, historic, what's the place called? Where do we? Oakwood Cemetery. But it's actually really called uh, Historic Confederate Oakwood Cemetery. I noticed that when I was editing the page. I'm like, oh, they took the word Confederate out of the name. Very interesting. A little whitewashing there, I guess. But Well, it's not just for Confederates, I guess. <laughs> we've acknowledged that we're okay. Just a private joke we've been having about uh, macaroni and cheese for some odd reason. The more tired you get, the more weird you get. Operation macaroni. Opera hey, Operation oh Macaroni and Cheese. I got it. Barbecue. Anything else? I've, I, it's just too hot. I know what you guys are thinking now. Two last comments. I don't care. Okay. Um, so first, uh, I guess another, I have no idea what the answer to this question is, but if one could make uh, sci scientific skepticism, <laughs> very good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Scientific skepticism, cool. Like, I, I don't know what that means. I'm but cool. You are. <laughs> but, uh, you know, how does one make it, make being a scientific skeptic, we just gotta cool. be, we just gotta meet more often and take pride in being, being what we are, and not be snotty and not be accusatory and just pe treat people respectfully because we're all there. I mean, I believed in astronomy and Lord knows what I believed in as a kid. Spontaneous oh, human combustion, oh, okay. uh, you know. That is the biggest thing. Stop talking Don't be insulting. Don't Let's. Talk they're on a path. Yeah, Help right. them along, you know and. And don't make them feel stupid. No, in fact, I think it, that's kind of the thing I was getting to sharing is how we came to our Absolutely. skepticism. And I think I, I love that you've shared you know, some things that you now know are not yeah. credible. Yeah. Well, I didn't have I didn't have Wikipedia. Think about spontaneous human combustion. For the people who don't know what that is, it's it's scary as hell. So when you're a little kid and you're raised in the in the times of, of um, Encyclopedia Britannica and TV shows, you got three channels. How are you going to know? If you ask your friends in the neighborhood, I've heard of this spontaneous human combustion thing, what are they going to tell you? Absolutely. The little girl who lived in your house before you. Here's her shoe. Why do you think that patch of grass is burned? Yeah, why do you think that patch of grass is, is burned? So there's nobody to turn to, but now we can turn to Wikipedia. But at the time, I don't know why. People of my age and my generation and older aren't more credulous because we really didn't have the resources to find this out. Somehow we made it through. Is, and the, the last thing is, is there a sort of a bulleted list of the top three or four things to keep in mind that constitute critical and critical thinking? Like, you know, demand evidence, question the quality of the evidence. I have no idea what number three would be, but it, is that list somewhere in, in Wikipedia? Is that referenced on your pages? I think, that, I think, I think that, that would be useful. All organizations have some sort of list. My personal one would probably be kind, would be number one. Uh, number two is anybody could fall for something. So don't, don't get off your high horse. And third is, you know, um, be willing to change your mind if better evidence is presented. I guess I'd be my one, two, three. I don't know. And then somewhere in there would be like, you know, be check your sources make sure that the sources that you're getting are the best sources you can possibly get and you know there's this thing called havana syndrome out right now oh my gosh what a nightmare that's been for us so uh because the the journal of american medical association kind of a high prestigious organization pretty much endorsed uh, havana syndrome as being something real and we've been fighting it on wikipedia ever since because it looks they've endorsed it the crickets in in cuba 
uh, the people say they've got headaches now and so on. Read it on Wikipedia, it's called Havana Syndrome. It's, it's been going on for a few years. Now we're starting to pay people. So if you've got, if you've got headaches and back pain and you were in an embassy or, or anywhere in the world and they, you you're now can claim, make a claim. So how, the sources, the things, the illnesses that can happen to you are just illnesses we all have. Aging or whatever. Anyway, Havana syndrome, check it out. Okay, so I guess that's it. So if you want to hang out and talk to me, please do so or talk to everybody. But I'm going to get something to eat, I think. If we're still hanging out. Yes, Jeff. I have business cards and I have stickers.